Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them. I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Robin Lloyd, a journalist and a novelist. This guy's a seafaring man. Okay, he grew up on the water pretty much. He grew up in the Virgin Islands, St. Croix, to be more specific, at least his early life. He was on a boat way back then. And when and his novels are water-based, ocean-based, uh, vessel-based. We stop and think about the great novels throughout history and novelists throughout history. Uh, people like uh, Herman Melville writing Moby Dick or The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway or, or even The Hunt for Red October by by Tom Clancy to, to get uh, um, a little bit more uh, recent. Uh, it, the ocean in all kinds of water, the ocean, the sea, uh, waterways, lakes, they've always been great fodder for novels. And Robin Lloyd has three different novels uh, out right now. One is called Rough Passage to London. Another is called Harbor of Spies. And then he's got his new novel, which is titled Hidden Cargo. And uh, we're going to be talking to Robin about um, his new novel, his past novels, about the writing business. Um, also, he uh, will talk about journalism because he's a journalist and a novelist. He's been involved in television journalism for more than 40 years. He's uh, working on camera as both a news reporter and on local and national on the local and national level, as well as as a producer and writer off camera. Uh, he's a veteran correspondent for NBC News. Uh, he was there for 15 years, filed reports from more than 30 countries, mostly in Latin America and Africa. Uh, numerous uh, wars were covered, uh, co conflicts and wars uh, he has covered. He's also covered the White House and the State Department during the Reagan and Bush administrations. And uh, among his awards are four Emmy Awards. So um, quite the... Uh, quite the record here. And it's not always easy to make the switch from journalism to fiction writing. There's many people who will tell you that because you're moving from a world of facts and figures to one of uh, where, although there's still research done, although we still research before we write most of the time, uh, there is still the whole, it's a different game. Let me put it that way. Even Tom Wolfe, the great Tom Wolf, Electric Kool Aid Acid Test, and and Bonfire of the Vanities uh, had said. In fact, he wrote it in the front of Bonfire of the Vanities, at least one of the editions that he was crestfallen when he started trying to write a novel after all those great and successful nonfiction books, and he found that he stunk at it. At least in the beginning, he did. He kept at it though, but he was crestfallen by the whole thing until he kept working at it, and eventually his talent. Um, his transcendent talent did assert itself in fiction writing as well. And he wrote, you know, several great novels, including Ban Bonfire of the Vanities. So with that, Robin Lloyd, welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Well, thank you so much. Good to be here. Well, and it's good to have you here. Uh, talk a little bit about writing water-based, ocean-based, vessel-based novels. Uh, you have a lot of experience on the water, and yet you could be writing in any kind of venue. Why do you write water-based? I don't know, I don't know what, what you would call them. I don't know if you would say water-based or ocean-based or vessel-based. How do you refer to them, and why do you write uh, uh, novels of that character? I think a lot of my writing goes back to growing up in the Caribbean and growing up on the island of St. Croix. Uh, there were many things in St. Croix that made it truly an exceptional place to grow up. One of them was the proximity of water all around you. And my parents uh, were in the business of dairy farming and a, and, a, and a dairy business, which I got involved in. But they took their time off sailing an old leaky wooden boat around the Caribbean 
uh, I got dragged along at age three um, uh, from one island to the next. Uh, so it was quite an adventure. I wasn't always that happy because I got seasick all the time. Uh, however, I was able to get over that and, and enjoy uh, the experience of seeing so much of the Caribbean so early on in my life. And I think one of the things that um, sailing that early, getting your sea legs, uh, basically when you've just learned to walk and you don't even know how to swim yet, uh, is that it becomes part of you. Uh, the waves, the feel, the salt, uh, you felt it uh, in, in such a uh, deep part of your subconscious that uh, you, uh, uh, it just pours out of you. Um, you know, so in, in my case, as a child, I had a couple of near uh, death experiences. At age three, I went over to the side, uh, hit by the boom. And the, if it hadn't been for a life preserver I, I, and being fished out, I probably would have been dead then. And then uh, another nighttime passage through a storm going from St. Croix to St. Martin with my parents. And uh, the boat was, as I said, a leaky wooden boat. And the planks sh shifted in the heavy weather. And there was a bucket brigade all night long taking water out of the hold. Uh, it was left a strong impression on me. Uh, so it, confronting that kind of danger early on, again, leaves you a little bit with what uh, Conrad had in his image of the sea, was it was something to fear, <laughs> as well as something to admire and, and, uh, and, and, and look at it with, with all its uh, beauty and magnificence. So I would say the sea is in me, and it came from uh, growing up in St. Croix. Uh, that being said, I didn't really discover that I liked to write about it until I wrote the first book, Rough Passage to London, which uh, started out as a nonfiction. Uh, it had to do with a very interesting man, who uh, a Connecticut man who was my direct ancestor from way back when in the early 1800s. And all I knew about him uh, when I started to research him was that he, he was a well-known ship captain out of New York sailing to London. And he was an excellent friend, a very good friend of Charles Dickens. The connection between this man, uh, a basically Yankee tar, if you will, uh, and, and none other than Charles Dickens set me on a journey to find out why and how those two met. And the way I, I ended up doing it, because I was sort of a reluctant novelist, but I, it, was, it, it appeared to be the only way for me to tell his story through historical fiction. And this was me discovering uh, the wonders of historical fiction. Uh, I really put myself uh, with all the knowledge I had of his background uh, in his shoes. So I uh, climbing the masts, walking the decks, uh, you know, dealing with storms, uh, living the life of sailing across on a three masted packet ship. Uh, he did 100 transatlantic passages over a 30 year period. Uh, and uh, the result was I felt that historical fiction gave me something that as much as I'd been a reporter all my life, I, I never really could have done in a nonfiction. And that is the sights, sounds, smells, emotional uh, intrigue, uh, things that I could not have told as well in a nonfiction. And I just got so excited about the potential of marrying uh, a well-researched topic and then turning it into fiction. Uh, so it was a discovery. I went from being um, an accidental novelist to a reluctant novelist as I struggled with uh, learning the trade. It's like learning a, a, a new foreign language. It's full of twists and turns and, and a, a never-ending learning curve, one of them being how to do credible conversation and move the story along. Uh, so it's been a learning experience for me, um, but I have to say, I don't know as I would have been able to do it without the training uh, of a reporter. Interesting. So yeah, it can be, it can be an asset. It can be a liability in some ways. People love the water and uh, even though a lot of people do suffer from seasickness and you did as well, it sounds to me like you, uh, your body simply acclimated to that motion sickness that you were getting over, over time. Was that the case, Robin? 
it was a mystery to me because I, I was uh, uh, predictably miserable for the first two days on every one of these uh, uh, journeys that my parents would take me off on. And, you know, I, I was on a diet of uh, uh, basically ginger ale and, and saltine crackers <laughs> for the first two days. Uh, and then hopefully it stayed down and, and then it would go away. Uh, and, and then when I, by the time I got to be a teenager, it's still a mystery. I'd love to have a doctor explain it. I, um, I just went away. I, I got on a boat and took off and I wasn't seasick at all. So I, I would love to have a doctor explain that. Yeah, it sounds like you just simply acclimated, but maybe not. Maybe it was a, uh, a minor miracle there. You mentioned ginger ale. And I am uh, friends with a, a, a fellow who is, a, he owns a sailing school, and he developed something called Sailor Secret, which all it is is, is high-grade ground uh, ginger, and he puts it in capsules. So instead of Dramamine, he says, you take these for people who have motion sickness or seasickness, and because uh, obviously if you get out on the water in a sailboat, um, depending on on uh, how that's being navigated, it can it can definitely. The only time I've ever had motion sickness, in fact, on the water, started to feel motion sickness was in, in the bottom of a sailboat when it got when the guy up top who owned the boat was cutting loose, and I was basically uh, keeping myself from slamming from one wall <laughs> to the other. That sounds um, like you had a good storm. We well, it wasn't a storm. He just wanted to. He was just cutting loose. He just wanted to navigate the water. He wanted to uh, have some fun out there. And um, and it was all, all good and well. I I, I held it together. Uh, I, was, I was okay. Uh, but the beauty of the water attracts so many people. But it is also threatening to a lot of people. Talk a little bit about being on the water. In one of the characteristics of water can can be, or being in a boat in the water can be isolation, which can be beautiful, or it can be very scary. Um, talk a little bit about being on the water and, and what that means in terms of um, it being maybe something meditative or something that uh, uh, gives you an experience you simply cannot have on terra firma. I think that once again is why I like writing about the sea, because uh, I spent so much solitary time as a young boy uh, on, on, on board a 57 foot uh, sailing boat. Uh, my parents were off to their own uh, conversational world, and I would isolate myself by going up into the bow. Uh, and uh, as you say, you become very meditative because you, your world uh, that you look around is the sparkle of the sea on the water. Um, uh, the sun sparkle uh, is, is the cresting waves, the, uh, the sea foam that is uh, creeping its way onto the leeward side of the boat. Uh, yeah, the the sun through the sails, um, the first glimpse of land. Uh, it, it, perhaps you're lucky and you get dolphins uh, deciding to surf along the bow, uh, and you get into a separate, uh, as you say, a meditative uh, mode of thinking. You you and to this day, if I get out uh, sailing in the ocean, I I, I fall into that uh, meditative mode. Let me ask you about uh, the family business. So this was a dairy uh, uh, farm or a dairy, and um, I don't, I don't have not for many, many years drunk any cow's milk. I will tell you that I had a radio program for a while where I interviewed a guy who owned a uh, place that, that produced raw milk, and he had me drink some. And um, I don't know if you've had the experience of drinking raw milk, but it's delicious. And it's supposed to be much healthier for you than the homogenized, pasteurized, uh, bastardized stuff that you get in the supermarket. Uh, was raw milk part of your your uh, diet growing up, Robin? Uh, my father, unbelievable as it may sound, uh, started uh, his business by buying 50 uh, Jersey cows and importing them from the States. Uh, and with those Jersey cows, he sold his milk, raw milk, out of a metal can on the back of a Willis Jeep, uh, ladling it out to people that would come in with their own bottles. Uh, so then he began that business in the in the late 50s. And uh, fortune smiled on him because tourism arrived in St. Croix and the demand for milk just grew and grew. And he was able to form a coalition of farmers on the island. And they all uh, switched to dairy herds 
uh, he uh, got the bank to invest in him in doing a dairy plant and uh, began homogenizing and pasteurizing the milk as he was required to do at that time uh, to, to sell the milk. But it all started out with uh, raw milk. And um, I, even working at the dairy, uh, there's nothing I like more because the milk, as soon as it came out of the cow, went into a refrigerated metal tank. And there was nothing nicer than uh, at the end of the day, having a gl cool glass of uh, raw milk right, right from that container. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's rich and it's, it's, I don't know how healthy it is. He used to say it was very healthy, but, uh, I think probably medicine has moved on since then. Well, I can tell you that the, the fella who, uh, owned this, um, um, oh God, I forget the name of it. it might be Berkeley farms or something like that in Northern California. And he said that the composition of the fat and raw milk is the same as olive oil. It's it's a polyunsaturated fat. It's, it's good. It's actually a good fat. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm not a nutritionist. I couldn't say, but um, it was delicious. I will say that, and and supposedly very good for you. So in time, you attended Princeton University, um, one of the very esteemed you know institutions of higher learning in the states. And you majored in Latin American studies and you developed a proficiency in Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Now, did you at that time want to work for the United Nations or were you already thinking about being a journalist and, 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 uh, and circling the world? Um, or neither? <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are times when you have lots of different ideas. I uh, wanted to be uh, at one point an economist working for the World Bank uh, or, you know, in, in Latin America. Uh, and that, that was one thought I had. Another thought was being a diplomat. Um, and I remember what changed me is interviewing a few people my senior year on what their lives were like, people who were actually in these positions. And I couldn't identify with any, any, anyone but a journalist. Uh, and, and, um, and I thought, okay, well, um, that maybe is something that I should consider. I can travel the world as a journalist. I can use my languages as a journalist. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, that being said, my father was uh, very anxious or eager that I join him in running the dairy business, which I was not keen on doing after graduating from Princeton. So uh, I had to sort of prove myself and to him that uh, this dream of being a journalist was something more than just a dream. Well, and in fact, you then went on to graduate school. You got your graduate degree in, uh, at the School of Journalism at Columbia University, one of the best journalism schools in the country, and uh, obviously went on to be a, um, a decorated journalist and very well-traveled journalist. And um, in these days, you spend your time in Maryland and Maine, be, in between those two states. Um most recently, the biggest project that you finished is your new novel called, uh, again, it's Hidden Cargo. Talk about the premise of that novel without giving away any um, secrets to the uh, uh, would-be readers. Well, uh, Hidden Cargo is is actually a sequel to this my second book, Harbor of Spies. Uh, the second book uh, is really all about Cuba uh, in, in, in the days when Cuba was very wealthy. Uh, most people don't think of Cuba as wealthy, but in, when it was Spanish colonial Cuba, uh, it was a place that was really one large plantation, uh, coffee, sugar, uh, tobacco. There were thousands of, literally thousands of plantations on that island. Every bit of that island was covered with plantations. And of course it was thanks to uh, slavery that uh, it was so profitable for these uh, owners. Uh, so it was quite a, a, an unusual place. Uh, you had a, a sense of feudal uh, Spain uh, with, with um, people in carriages and dressed in uh, fine trappings. And then you, you had all this poverty and you had the, the, the horrific slavery. Uh, I just couldn't believe what I was reading about Cuba at the time. So that was Harbor of Spies. It was a, a story of, uh, of uh, Confederates uh, running arms and, and uh, smuggling arms into the Gulf area during the war. And that's the sailing part of the, uh, the, the story. 
uh, I did want to find out about blockade running and how that worked. And I, I got a pretty darn good sense of it. Uh, and most people didn't realize that it came out of Havana, not just uh, Bermuda and the Bahamas. But Spain, like England, basically favored, uh, uh, they didn't take sides officially, but they favored the Confederacy. Why? Because of cotton. And uh, that was, uh, the, you know, the, the, the diplomacy during our uh, uh, Civil War was so important in, in terms of uh, convincing the European states not to side with the Confederacy. That, in effect, that was uh, that, that book. But it, it, it has a personal story of this central character who's fi fictitious character uh, who comes to Cuba and gets embroiled in a lot of intrigue but he comes to Cuba to try to discover his family because he's lost his mother and she went to her deathbed with the secret of why she fled Cuba and fled her, her grandmother and never wanted to, her mother rather, and never wanted to have the children ever speak her mother's name. And so at the death of his mother, this young man, uh, Everett Townsend, goes to Cuba uh, to discover his, his, his past. And what he, of course, falls into is something he's not expecting. He's discovering his family's close ties to slavery. So I uh, brought that up in that book, Harbor of Spies, but I felt I really hadn't uh, completed that story. And, and um, so I wanted to return to it. So Hidden Cargo is uh, picks up Everett Townsend's life. Uh, two and a half years later, the Civil War is over. Uh, he served in the Union Navy uh, for two years. Um, and so this interesting character had done blockade running for the South and, and then uh, become a Union Navy captain and fought uh, in, in the Civil War off the coast of Florida, uh, which in itself is a very interesting chapter of the Civil War. In any case, the book, book picks up uh, Townsend, uh, very disconsolate, uncertain about what his next step is. Uh, his father has died as well, uh, leaving him alone. His, uh, uh, the girlfriend he thought he was going to marry has left him and uh, gone back to Cuba. And he basically um, is realizing that he uh, is going to have to go back to Cuba to uh, see his grandmother there. And uh, he knows what's waiting for him because it's a, a, a large plantation, a slave plantation, and she wants him to um, to, to run it uh, uh, for her, and he doesn't want to do that. Uh, but he has a family obligation. So this story uh, um, really turns the, the tide. Every time you write a fiction story, whether it's in the first chapter, second chapter, third chapter, whatever, there has to be a turning point where it's literally like turning the engine on a car. And the, the, the engine for, for this uh, novel becomes when he gets caught up in a hurricane and discovers a, a wrecked ship and inside the wrecked ship are a lot of dead bodies. Um, and uh, he realizes that those people have probably been locked inside the ship and they drowned there. And he's horrified by this and reports it to his naval commander in Key West. And that begins his search for who did this and why. Uh, and it, it takes you uh, from Key West uh, to Cuba where he uh, goes back to Cuba as a government agent. Um, they want to use him as a government agent to try to find out uh, uh, what was going on inside Cuba. Uh, I don't want to be a, a spoiler, but it has to do with a, an actual fact uh, in history that is little known, that immediately after the Civil War, there were numerous credible reports of smuggling of freedmen from the plantations uh, by American ships taken to Cuba and sold back into slavery there. It's a shocking story. I mean, I, when I read that, I thought this is uh, the most heinous thing I've ever, ever read, that people who have just been freed have been tricked onto a boat and then sold back into slavery in this horrific uh, slave plantations on Cuba. At uh, any rate, it, it affected me so much that I knew that that was the, the, the story. And, and, and so in, this, in that sense, there was a personal side of the novel I wanted to write in Hidden Cargo, but the research actually plunged me right into a, a story full of international intrigue. 
Wow. And that is just an absolutely vulgar crime to the selling of people back into slavery who have just been freed. I remember there was a movie called 10 Years a Slave where a, a man who, I'm not sure he was ever a slave, but he was um, drugged and and sold into slavery. So, I mean, it's unbelievable what human beings do to one another at times. And in this novel, uh, who, which has received praise from, uh, among other people, David, David Ignatius, who is a very well-known columnist for the Washington Post. He also appears on television. He is a novelist himself. And um, I don't know how he finds the time between uh, being a full-time columnist, appearing on TV, writing novels, and so on. And he says that, uh, I'm going to quote from David Ignatius here, Hidden Cargo is a triumph. Robin Lloyd has spliced his ma mastery of the of sea stories with a mystery saga that reveals a vicious plot to kidnap freed blacks after the Civil War and sell them back into enslavement in Cuba. This is Lloyd's best and most satisfying book yet. Again, that's David Ignatius of the Washington uh, Post. So this is a sequel to your second book. What about your uh, your next one would be your fourth book. Does the story continue or are you thinking of a departure from that in a, in a completely new new uh, story? I wish I knew. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think the first thing I have to do is think about it. Second thing I have to do is talk to the publisher and uh, see what their uh, thinking is. And then I'll go from there. I, I, the the um, I don't know why, but Cuba has always uh, fascinated me. When I was at Princeton, I um, I was very much focused on on Cuba, but in the 20th century, not so much the 19th century. And uh, this whole uh, novel writing that I've been doing, uh, two books are now about Cuba, uh, and uh, I'm just fascinated by something I didn't know anything about, uh, Cuba's colonial past. There's so many connections with what Cuba's present is today. Uh, the Spanish colonial rulers were every bit as uh, uh, repressive as, as the current government is uh, in terms of uh, uh, squashing uh, free speech uh, and civil disobedience. Uh, the, the, the Spanish rulers were just as bad. So when I look at this poor country, that went from all that repression uh, under the Spanish to then uh, to have have basically a, a malfunctioning democracy for so many years, and then um, a, a, a a a very restrictive communist government uh, for now, uh, whatever it is, 50, 60 years. Uh, uh, it, it just um, it makes me sad uh, about the, this island and what it's had to experience, and yet. The Cuban people, if you know the Cuban people, they are such wonderful people. Uh, they're, they're nice, they're open, they're friendly. They, they don't hold grudges or resentments against you as an American, despite the sanctions. Uh, and it's such a, uh, a disappointment to me that we as uh, two different countries can't uh, find a way to have uh, a rapprochement. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so frustrating. Uh, you know, all those years of sanctions that, that simply didn't work anyway and and didn't give us any real way to influence the island and and now we've got a new drama unfolding with China having a uh, some kind of uh, uh, surveillance base there and I guess they're going to start training doing some military training there as well which has got some people on edge about about that as well so um uh, if if we can ever uh, if Cuba can ever free itself I, it's going to be a wonderful place to visit. I guess it's, it is anyway, because I've talked to people who have been there, you've been there, and they uh, say wonderful things about, as, as you did, Robin, the people, and um, and just the beauty of the place and such. So um, hopefully things um, will improve over time as well. Are you still a sailor? Do you still get out on the water? Do you have a boat? Uh, I do. I still have a boat. Uh, I don't know how long I'll keep the boat, but I've, I've had a... Uh... A smaller version of the boat, uh, the similar type of boat that my father had, that leaky old wooden boat I told you about. Well, I found a, a fiberglass hull, <laughs> but a much smaller boat, not, not quite as uh, large and ambitious a boat as my parents had. And uh, I've been sailing that up here in Maine um, uh, in the summers uh, for uh, more than 20 years. Enjoyed it greatly. Uh, but uh, uh, my wife no longer really likes to sail as much as she used to. Uh, so I'm uh, contemplating uh, uh, 
selling the boat to, to my chagrin. I, I don't know if I, I will. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, you know, they say, um, of course, you're a different case, but they say, you know, the two favorite, the two happiest times in a, a boat owner's life is the day um, they buy it and the day they sell it. <laughs> but but those are people who probably uh, don't have the background you have and, and, and necessarily the love of the water that you do. Um, what about, um, I, well, this is probably an impossible question to answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Do you have a favorite water body, a, a favorite place to, to sail, what, whether you're navigating it yourself or it's a maybe even a big, a big, much bigger ocean um, going vessel? Well, I've sailed in the Mediterranean. I've sailed in the Baltic. Uh, I, I've sailed all over the Caribbean, uh, obviously. Um, I've sailed up and down the coast of Maine and down the East Coast uh, into Long Island Sound. Certainly sailed all around Florida. Um, and so those are some of the experiences I've had. I've never sailed in the Pacific, sadly. Um, but I would say uh, what what I've en enjoyed the most in terms of uh, sheer relaxation and the beauty of the environment around is sailing in Maine, uh, the, where the mid coast of Maine is, I think, some of the best cruising ground in America. Uh, from the point of view of an exotic uh, destination, I really enjoyed sailing um, out of Germany, uh, up the coast, uh, through Denmark and the islands off Denmark, and then up the coast of Sweden. Uh, another time, uh, I went through the Gota Canal, which uh, basically is an old 19th century canal that goes from the Baltic right to the North Sea through, through the entire country of Sweden. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, so I've I've uh, I, I've I've had boating experiences here and there. I, I, I could still do a lot more, but uh, I would love to. Uh, I guess the thing that people want to do now is they want to do that Northwest Passage, uh, and I, I guess if you have the right boat, that would be quite a stunning trip. Now, um, you mentioned the meditative aspect the ice the, the solitude have you ever had a mystical experience on the water i'm not sure i i i, I could say that uh because that implies that you might be near death uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh no i i don't think I, I i would ever uh call it mystical i call it meditative i mean i think the water um uh, and it's still to this day, if I, if, if, if I look on a sailing boat at uh, the sparkle, the sun sparkle in the, on the water, I will find myself getting into a hypnotic state of some kind where um, I, I really uh, get into a sort of a daze uh, because of the beauty of all those uh, stars on the water. Um, and it relaxes me. Yes, yes. Now, am I correct that your dad, in addition to owning the um, uh, dairy, um, was also a newspaper ed editor? Well, yeah, he uh, uh, it was one of the ironies uh, about about him is he didn't want me to get into journalism, <laughs> but his his first foray into the world of working uh, was running a small paper in rural Virginia. And uh, uh, I believe it was called the Courier Gazette. He did that for a few years. And then he, he, uh, he started a, a, a magazine called Chronicle of the Horse, which still exists today, as he was very much passionate about uh, the horse world. Uh, and then along came World War II, and he found himself in the OSS um, uh, working from London and then going undercover uh, as uh, OSS uh, uh, behind the battle scenes, uh, uh, soldier working with mercenaries, not mercenaries, with the freedom fighters in Italy and France. Uh, so he had quite an adventurous and dangerous three years in the war. And when he came back, life had changed. Uh, his first wife uh, had left him and uh, he remarried. And, uh, and then the, my mother and he moved to St. Croix for a very different life. So he went to St. Croix, obviously a very beautiful place. Did he know what he was going to do there? Did he know that he wanted to um, open a dairy farm or get in the dairy business? Well, they, moved, they moved to St. Croix because my mother had been a polio victim. And so I think for health reasons was the reason they moved to St. Croix 
as well as to probably have an adventure. I know from looking at his old correspondence that he briefly thought about starting a Caribbean tourism magazine, uh, which of course did happen much later, decades later. But I guess he dropped that for lack of funding. And for some reason, maybe he and his and my mother uh, coalesced behind this idea of running a farm, which of course was needed. There was no dairy farm at that time in St. Croix. And uh, he built a, a, a business uh, up from scratch. So not only was it not a dairy farm, but in the Lloyd household, there was not a television. Oh, that's and true. I, that I don't know how you picked up that detail. But yeah, my mother was, uh, it was, it was very beneficial to me because I, 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 my, my world as a child was uh, uh, school, uh, sailing, maybe get on a horse, uh, uh, maybe play with a friend, but mostly read books because there was no TV at home. So you spent a lot of time at the library is my understanding. And um, we said we had access to all kinds of books. So what did you choose to read? Was it anything, any subject matter uh, were there any authors who were favorites of yours, even even way back then? Well, it was funny because my mother must have uh, worked a deal with somebody back in the States. And I had a room full of old books <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of them were English uh, uh, and some of them were about animals. Some of them were about sailing. Some of them were mysteries. So I think she just basically found a cheap way to get a lot of books and put them in my room. And so I, as a kid, had that surround all around me. And so I would go from reading um, uh, a Western by Zane Gray, or, or I'd go, uh, as what's the Canadian writer who wrote about the wilderness, Ernest Thompson Seton, I think was his name or maybe Ernest Seton Thompson, I'm not sure. Uh, and then, you know, there were English writers like Arthur Ransom. Uh, these were all kids' books. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think I read the Black Beauty series uh, uh, and, uh, and eventually got into reading John Buchan. Uh, so these are all sort of names that come to mind uh, of uh, largely read preteen when I was... Uh, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11. Uh, I, I was an avid reader. Yeah, it sounds like it. So you, ironically, even though you didn't have a television in the house, you ended up a TV journalist, a TV reporter. And um, I had heard you say that there's a former New York Times reporter who really set you, um, a, kind of turned you away from newspapers and towards television journalism. Tell Tell us about that. Uh, in 1973, as I mentioned before, I went around and interviewed people in in the in the world of uh, the, you know the State Department, uh, working for banks. I wanted to travel internationally, and I wanted a profession that would allow me to travel internationally. One of the persons I talked to was a retired at that time a retired New York Times reporter named Ira Freeman, and um, he was a friend of my grandmother's. And I was able to get in to see him, and he he'd, he'd written a uh, a book that I think did fairly well called "Out of the Burning," uh, as I recall. In any case, um, he was recently out of the New York Times, and I went to him and I said, you know, I think I might like to be a journalist, and I I, uh, I you know I'm thinking, you know, where do you think I could start? Uh, you know, I was just thinking print, um, and uh, he said, print is dead. This is 1973. He said, print is over. Uh, television is where it's at. You've got to be a television journalist. So uh, I took him at his word. And uh, that's what I started to do is trying to find work in television journalism, which is no easy task now. And it certainly wasn't then. Yeah, I bet. What, how did you get your break? How did you get your first newspaper job? Was it just to, did you get lucky or was there some event that happened that uh, that uh, kind of sealed the deal? There were a few lucky breaks. I, I wrote a, just an off the charts, a random letter to the man who worked um, for NBC News in Buenos Aires uh, as the correspondent uh, down there. And I was aware of his reporting and I found out that he'd gone to Princeton. So I, I wrote him just a, you know, a, a, a letter. I didn't know him from Adam and I had no connection. 
And I said, are you looking for a gopher? I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. Um, so he, he I, to my surprise, I got a letter back from him. He offered me floor space in his apartment and I, I would be his gopher. Uh, and uh, there wasn't much offer for much pay. Uh, he was gonna teach me how to be a radio stringer. Uh, I knew that that was a, a possible learning experience. So off I went, I, I had the money to get down there and then I had no money. Uh, I did it for about three or four months, but there just wasn't enough news. And I came back to uh, St. Croix with uh, my tail between my legs. And I was able to get uh, a job at the, the local TV station there. Um, again, this is a person who hadn't watched much television in life uh, and uh, found myself uh, on air uh, with no training whatsoever, uh, broadcasting on the island I'd grown up in. Wow. So um, let's let's get a little more up to date then. Here you are. You are a uh, professional novelist now. Talk about your writing regimen when you're working on a book. Are you a morning writer? Do you pick time, uh, various times during the day? How big a block of time do you set aside? Where do you work? Can you give us some insight? My open, modus operandi for, to, to start a book is first it, to find what I want to write about. I, I research for about a year. So I, I may know generally the area uh, that I want to research, but I, I really don't write a thing. I just read in, in to a point where I start with um, the larger history books. I, uh, that takes me down to maybe some scholarly articles. That takes me to actual articles of the time period. Uh, I read uh, if there are uh, diaries or memoirs, I read that uh, to a point where I begin to sort of have a separate reality uh, of being in that time zone. And then I hope I find uh, a, a hook to do a story. And, and one of the things that I think reporting trained me to do is to find the story. And I think if someone asked me, well, what is it that reporting has taught you as a fiction writer? It is to find the story. Uh, you, you, you're thrown all sorts of material as a reporter, but yet you find the headline and you, and you then find a way to tell the story that, that the reader can understand. And the difference with fiction writing, of course, is that whereas in journalism, you're trying to clobber your reader or your listener over the head with this is the story, uh, in, in creative writing, you're much more cryptic. And you're not trying to um, necessarily clobber anyone over the head. You're trying to create and visualize a scene which people can interpret in different ways. Uh, so, um, any rate, that that uh, I just wanted to get that little bit in about uh, news reporting and and uh, in terms of my regimen, um, when I actually get down to writing, uh, it, it's usually um, I try to say to myself whether it's morning or afternoon, uh, I need to write about three or four hours um, a day and, uh, and and then get up and stretch and think. And, and I don't try to kill myself with the uh, eight hour, nine hour days. Yeah, oh, that's just, it's too difficult. I mean, that's very exacting work writing is and, and the idea of going, making it a full day, like an eight hour work day is um, completely um, intimidating. And I think for most people just just not possible there is the rare person who will actually put that kind of time and probably working on a, on a grueling deadline uh at that point uh but that was some good insight that uh, about the the fact that uh you know you're looking for the story uh, as a journalist does and um um and finding uh, finding that story and and the the nuance involved the subtleties unlike a news story like you say there's there's those uh, nuances or subtleties involved in letting that story reveal itself over over hundreds of pages so what about your state of mind when you're writing are you um is right is it a is writing a frustrating experience for you are you uh is is your state of mind uh uh one of excitement. How would you characterize? I'm not even sure that's a fair question, but um, I want to ask it anyway. I think if you visualized a story uh, of what what um, what what you generally want to write about, uh, the the whole um, 
notion of uh, actually getting the story, actually writing the story, you've already in your mind, you've visualized something, uh, a scene or two or three. Uh, and so it, there is a sense of unraveling, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a ball of thread and unraveling a ball of thread and letting it go. Um, and that's, that's a relief in some ways, uh, because a writer uh, has this pent up uh, uh, ideas and the it's cathartic to be able to finally write the story and get characters going and um, get to know those characters because as you write you get to know them a little bit better uh, as you as you create scenes uh, and create conversations suddenly the character is developing a, a slightly different uh, gradation in his uh, personal traits that you might not have realized. Uh, so it's exciting to write. Uh, and it's exciting to write fiction for me because it is unraveling as you write. And it's so different from nonfiction where you plan and plot what your story is. You've outlined it to the nth degree and um, and you're, you're filling in the various paragraphs and chapters with the research that you've done. With fiction, it's a little bit somewhat out of your control. Uh, your characters do have, I mean, I know this is something that people talk about, but it is true. The characters go off in their own direction. And the reason why that happens is that you get a conversation going and you don't really know where it's, where it's going. You just, it goes and, and um, you follow it and it might take you to some place you're not expecting which then takes you to another turn in the road. That's the exciting thing about writing fiction to me is the unpredictability. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's a beautiful thing when the characters uh, decide, well, we're not going that way. We're going this way. And and this is what's going to happen when they take on a life of their own. And uh, for people who have never written or never written fiction, they don't realize just how real those characters become. Uh, they are uh, very much a part of the, you know, consciousness of the writer, there's a relationship there. And uh, as you say, there there is this um, surprise element. You don't know where where the story or the characters are going to take you. And uh, there, there, there are times when it's like a wow. Um, let me ask you about your biggest or most important writing lesson that you've learned, whether it was conveyed by another person to you or whether it was just an insight through your own years of writing, what, what's what's that biggest lesson that you would identify? Well, in journalism, keep your sentences short, uh, not too many adjectives, strong verbs, uh, pacing, very important, the pacing. Uh, in, in creative writing, uh, as much as I might not like to admit it, uh, conversation is extremely important. <laughs> Not only the texture of the conversation and the, the the reliability of it in terms of the characters, uh, but being able to move the story along. I think the thing that I learned most about creative writing is that story, whatever paragraph you write, whatever conversation you have, you have to move the story forward, always moving forward. So many writers uh, who like descriptions, for instance, will get caught up in describing a room uh, the light coming through the window, uh, uh, shining through a, a, a blue vase and sparkling on a tangerine plate, you know, they, and they'll go into this, uh, yeah. this description uh, like that. But I, an editor once told me um, all that is more or less deadwood. Uh, you have to, uh, and the same goes for uh, wanting to insert history into your creative writing. If you can tie it into the story, make it pertinent to the story, uh, go ahead, you know, insert it. But otherwise, it's Deadwood, and Deadwood slows the story down, and you don't want that. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I was just talking with David Rosenfeld, uh, another novelist, yesterday, and, and we got on this subject about the whole uh, idea of description, which description can be a beautiful thing if it's if it's kept tight and it's kept uh, integral to the story, but but yeah, oftentimes people, uh, writers get caught up in the in the descriptive stuff, and it, it really does slow the story to a crawl. And that's a great place to lose a reader. Then, so you definitely have to be very cautious about that. Let me ask you about uh, 
what is next? Now, you don't know. You don't have your next novel doped out yet, but um, I'm assuming that you're going to be looking to write a fourth novel. What is the process like for you? Is is this something where you're just going to kind of go back to your regular life and be reading the stuff you like to read and something will present itself? Or is it more along the lines of uh, you uh, thinking about um, what uh, might um, just work for your editor, your agent, the readers? Um, and, and, and also, it, will it be a, 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 a seafaring novel again? I think it probably will be a seafaring novel because uh, on a practical, uh, for practical purposes, the publisher uh, likes the fact that, or has liked uh, the fact that I have focused on the age of sale. Uh, and um, I think they would probably like me to continue one way or another in, in that vein. Uh, so if I, um, if I, if I get, a, get the nod from them, I probably will think of some way to stay in the age of sale, that is the 19th century. Uh, what I'll do, I don't know. I think a big question is, do I continue Everett Townsend's story? Uh, and I might, uh, but I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know exactly what I would, um, would focus on. I guess one of the things that uh, historically interests me, I don't necessarily have a, a, a story in mind, is how long it took for uh, slavery to end in Cuba, another 20 years after the end of the American Civil War, and then how long it took Cuba to be independent from Spain. It took the uh, Spanish-American War to do that, and that was 1898. Uh, so these poor people were basically in a state of uh, civil war for decades, uh, and uh, and and uh, really only became free after the Americans left in the early 1900s. So somewhere in there, there's a story. I don't know exactly what I would do, but um, uh, if I continue with Everett Townsend, I'll have to be respectful of his lifespan. But uh, you know, so we'll see what happens. Well, Robin Lloyd, thank you for coming on the program. I wish you best of luck with your future endeavors. Really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to talk to you.